Hello everyone, I'm Wen Gong, and today I'll be talking about uh, my, uh, my work on using um, graph neural networks for um, drug discovery. This is um, joint work with my advisor, Regina and Tommy, as well as uh, my collaborators at bioengineering departments like Professor Collins, um, John, and, and other students. So um, drug discovery is a uh, very challenging problem. Um, the goal is to find molecules that satisfy all the constraints of the properties. For example, if you want to find um, a cure for COVID-19, then um, you want a molecule that is pot antiviral and also to be safe and uh, can be digested by the human body. There are a lot of constraints. And um, so you can think of it from a computational perspective as a, as a search process. So you have a universe of molecules like up to the 10 to the 30 years and more. Uh, we don't know what's the accurate estimate of it, but it is really large. And uh, you want to uh, find um, good molecules out of this vast chemical space. So currently drug design is often driven by um, the either expert knowledge or um, sort of root fall screening based on some machines. And it's a pretty inefficient and trial, uh, in, it's pretty inefficient process. So um, you can see that, um, so this approach um, based on human experts, uh, not based on expert knowledge can, can make some discovery uh, of the easier cases, like some obvious drugs that are, that are really good. Um, but after the low hanging fruits are gone, uh, the things get more and more difficult. So in the, in the case of antibiotic discoveries uh, for in the past 30 some years, we actually couldn't find a new class of antibiotics uh, that are structurally different from the previous um, uh, drug types. And this is important because of the resistance, right? Um, bacteria are easily just become resistant to the, to the antibiotics. And we always want to find new classes that are, that, are, that are new. So what is the problem that limits our discovery? So, um, so the current par um, paradigm for drug discovery, as I said, is sort of this brute force screening, which they call a high throughput screening. So you have this uh, a machine that's um, a mechanical device that will, um, you put all the molecules in your library and they will just test whether it is good or not. And then based on that, you will select some of the hits to further refine that to satisfy all the property constraints that you have. So now imagine that uh, the, the entire chemical space, right? Um, you can't really fit in everything there. In fact, you can at most select say 100K to up to 1 million compounds uh, into this machine. Uh, this is just really a tiny fraction of the of the entire space. And uh, quickly, you know, you have tested everything in your library, and uh, definitely you can't get anything new out of it unless you expand your search space to a wider set. So this, um, but again, the um, the conventional um, mechanic-based screening cannot scale up to more than this one million level. So what we propose here is to accelerate uh, antibiotic discovery using machine learning. So now suppose we have, uh, and indeed in practice, we have uh, molecules with their labeled antibacterial properties. So some of the molecules are good that are antibacterial, some of them are not. Okay, so we can use this training set to train a model um, that, um, that can predict for uh, the antibacterial property for any input compound then we can use that to uh, screen a much wider uh, chemical space because this neural network is, is much faster than this, um, uh, these machines in, in the lab. So um, of course um, the model needs to be accurate and, uh, and otherwise you will just uh, pr propose a bunch of false positives which only wastes um, experts time and the money. So this brings us to um, our, uh, the first part of the talk is how do we learn a good um, property prediction model for molecules to predict these properties, right? So um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, molecules are richly annotated graphs. Are, uh, you can think of it as 
so yeah, it's okay that you don't recognize what is, but uh, you, you can think of it abstractly as the graph. So uh, the node is the atoms and the bounds are the edges, right? So of course there are some other informations, for example, um, motifs like these are these rings are actually carry they they do carry some uh, functionality um, and uh, some chemical meanings and so together these um, components um, give rise to various chemical properties and that is the input to our model a graph with annotated information so of course this is not new and we have uh, a lot of work. Uh, has spurred from uh, early in 2015, um, the so-called uh, graph convolutional networks or message passing networks um, for uh, predicting these chemical properties. So um, the input is this molecule and then you want to predict um, different chemical properties given the training set. So I will just um, briefly um, describe what uh, a graph convolution is. This is uh, sort of just basic. Um, so initially, um, the input is a molecule with atoms, uh, these atom features, and bond as bond features, right? So atom could atom feature could be what is this atom type, whether it is a um, nitrogen or a carbon, and so on. Um, then you can do this um, message passing step. So basically, you propagate your feature into uh, from your from this node to your neighbors. It's like brief propagation. I really like this analogy. So you have your messages and you have your um, potentials at each node and then you can exchange at, uh, messages between these different um, um, atoms and what, what, what's the consequence? So if you do one step message passing, then um, this vector, this new vector um, out of this abstract equation, you can new make, you can parameterize this update function and aggregate function, however you want. So you can, after you make one step of this update, you will have a vector representing its one hop neighborhood subgraph. If you do two hop, uh, two steps, then you will expand this uh, to incorporate more uh, uh, a wider subgraph. So basically what it gives you is um, you do several steps of this graph convolution, and then you have these vectors associated with each other. And you can make a pooling, uh, you can pull them together into a vector, you put it into some feed forward network to predict uh, the inhibition score, like whether it inhibits the bacteria or not. So, so far this is pretty standard technique. Um, and we wanted to show that um, this can actually lead to new discovery of um, different, uh, of new class of antibiotics. So we, uh, this is a, a project that we uh, published in Cell uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, about um, our uh, faculties and students in the uh, um, bioengineering department. They provided us uh, a training set of around 2000 molecules with uh, labeled growth inhibition against this bacteria called E. coli. Uh, you don't need to know what that really is. It's just a bacteria that's actually really common uh, in our life. So we trained this graph convolution on this, um, on this set of molecules and we screened over say uh, 1, 000, uh, 10 thousand uh, molecules in a broad drug repurposing hub. We actually did a much larger experiment around 10 to the eighth compounds from the zinc library, but I'm not go gonna cover it today. Um, so we selected 100 molecules uh, to test them in, in vitro, basically put it into the lab and test um, these, uh, the bacterial antibacterial property of these 100 molecules. And it turned out that uh, around 50% of them are actually good. Uh, that has a really strong uh, antibacterial property. So of course, we want, what we want is not just some trivial modification of existing antibiotics, because the goal here is uh, try to find a new class of antibiotics that people couldn't really do based on their expert knowledge. So uh, among these 51 drugs, we prioritize those that are with uh, low uh, toxicity and structurally distinct from, or structurally novel from the existing compound. Oh, sorry, from the existing antibiotics that we have in the hospital. And we uh, found this one compound that is really unique and it actually does a really good job 
uh, of killing the bacteria. And moreover, it's, it's very different from the existing antibiotics. This is perhaps the, the crux of, uh, of this paper is really to show that we can, by um, casting net on a wider uh, subset of molecules, uh, we can, we're able to uh, find uh, novel uh, antib antibiotics for E. coli. And in fact, we found seven more very, very new um, antibiotics if we cast a net to the uh, to 10 to the eighth uh, molecules that's around uh, near 1 billion or 100 million um, compounds. And we can find more. And we validated them in, pra um, in the in biological experiments and, uh, and they're also uh, very effective. So um, this is sort of uh, an example of how uh, using uh, uh, machine learning can bring like a uh, real impact to really challenging biological problems that people have been stuck for, for, for 30 years. Um, now let's take a step back, right? So now we just plugged in some uh, standard models, right? Uh, While well, graph convolution is uh, still under like development and there are a lot of uh, interesting progress there. Um, but let's take a step back and see what about what we did, right? So the brief summary is we trained a model uh, and then we screen it over a, a large library of compounds. So the question here is really um, why, why screening, right? Um, just because people do screening based on these um, uh, machines, it doesn't mean that we have to do screening, right? Um, the entire chemical space is 10 to the 30th. It's really large and we can't really screen them all in, in, in a reasonable amount of time. So this motivates us to a, a different par paradigm. Uh, perhaps we can just learn to navigate the chemical space efficiently through generative models, right? So we can learn a distribution over the that turned 10 to the 30th molecules. And so we can learn a, um, dist um, we can try to highlight or uh, focus on, you know, send, uh, focus the probability mass around those good molecules that are either you know, antibacterial or antiviral, however you define it. So this allows you to avoid you know, explicitly screening all the compounds in your library, uh, which can be very large. And um, this, is the, this is also a challenging problem. Um, and there's no, so far, no uh, standard techniques that solves it. It's still a very active research area. And we made some uh, initial progress on top. Um, so this is basically an inverse problem of property prediction. So you have your criteria, you're um, generating, um, you based on some um, criteria of like potency, and then you want to generate some molecules. In fact, we can remove, if you just look at this problem from a computational point of view, you can, uh, the simplest, is, um, the core problem is how you generate these molecules, which are graph structure, right? So the problem here is how you generate graph. So there are some previous methods for molecule generation, which simply generate these graphs node by node, right? So it is a autoregressive model. Um, you start from scratch, basically nothing, and then you add one atom and then say, okay, we add one more atom and see whether this atom has an edge in between them. And we can do this, um, uh, iteratively, you know, expand this one by one and then see if, if, if it works. Uh, so at the end of the process, you will have a generated graph. But this is a problem, two problems. One is, um, first of all, not all sub molecules are valid. So to, in order to generate a valid molecule, you will actually go through some intermediate sub graphs that are not chemically valid. And in fact, uh, many of them are chemically invalid. So this means that you may end up, if the model decides to stop at the wrong time, then you will generate something that's really invalid, okay? And the other one is um, when you, um, so, let, so look at uh, this um, VAE model based on atom by atom approach. Um, it also doesn't scale well with respect to the molecule size. 
So uh, again, uh, if you so this is the reconstruction accuracy of the of your VAE with respect to the number of atoms, and you can see that when you have some tiny molecules, they do well. Um, but when you um, grow, uh, uh, move to larger molecules, they actually does a really bad job. It drops pretty significantly. So um, the, of course, the main reason is because. Uh, this atom by atom approach, it takes a long step, a long time to really finish generating the, the whole molecule. Um, you will take, for example, for this molecule, you will take around like 70 atom predictions and 70 bound predictions. And this is a really long chain of decision process. And you get a lot, um, end up, because this is a recurrent process, you will get a vanishing gradient problem or uh, if you make one tiny error during the decoding, you will, you will basically ruin the whole thing. So based on these motivations, we wanted to um, uh, propose a different approach um, to utilize these larger building blocks, which we call motifs, right? As I mentioned earlier, molecules, molecules are um, sort of defined, not just at the atom level, but also like, um, uh, motifs are, for example, like large molecules such as polymers, they exhibit these kind of hierarchical structure. You can see here that you have this uh, subgraph that appeared twice in the molecule. You have this ring that appeared three times in this molecule, right? So um, if we can, so we basically, if you generate this atom by atom, you will do a lot of repetitive work. And the proposal here is to instead we leverage these um, explicit motifs to generate uh, your molecule. So basically, in each step, you generate a motif rather than just a single atom. So in this case, you will just take 11 steps to generate this polymer structure. So just in case you don't really understand ooh, what that really means, um, let me make a simple analogy between uh, molecule and NLP. So when you do text generation, you can also generate based on character or based on words, right? So atom by atom approach is analogous to this character-based generation, while motif by motif-based approach can be like word or even phrase-based generation. I hope this analogy clarifies or give you a little bit of flavor of what we are trying to do. So of course, this is not trivial um, because once you operate over motif, then um, the representation also needs to be adjusted accordingly. So we, um, instead, um, we propose to view our molecule in a, in a hierarchical manner. Um, so what we can do is we can represent it as a hierarchical graph. You have your molecule here, and you know what are the motifs, right? And then uh, you can um, represent it in terms of how the motifs are connected. Um, or how the motifs are attached together. I will not go into too much detail of what these really, uh, what the attachment layer means, but if you just look at the motif layer, this is basically a graph pooling, right? You pull your molecule into a more uh, coarsened graph where each, each, each node represents a larger functional group. So uh, what we can um, do is instead of running message passing isolated uh, in isolated, manner on each layer, we can actually do a hierarchical uh, graph, uh, graph convolution. You, do, uh, you run a message passing network on your atom layer and then propagate all these uh, node vectors into your upper layers and you do graph convolution there too and then and, 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 and vice versa. So basically um, this, will, this joint representation will show what is the um, uh, what the molecule looks like in terms of motifs as well as the atoms from coarse grain to fine grain. So to generate molecule based on motifs, what we do is, is also simple. It's basically uh, incrementally expand this hierarchical graph. So in each step, we can predict what is the next motif that should be added to the molecule and then decide how it should be attached to the current graph, right? We decompose the attachment prediction process into two baby steps. One is predict what's the attaching point on your new motif, and then decide how this new motif should be attached to the current graph. And we can 
each of these steps can be parameterized by a, uh, a, a, a module um, based on a neural network. So um, we did some experiments on, on polymer generation, um, which um, we um, basically, we adopted a lot of um, 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 metrics to um, basically, the goal is to generate realistic molecules in this case that, that looks the, uh, distributionally um, similar uh, to the real compound. Okay, so we have uh, these different statistics, just like um, uh, inception distance in, for, for image generation. Basically, we also have a lot of statistics to capture the distributional discrepancy between your generated compounds versus um, the real compound, okay? Um, and we can see that um, in terms of um, the realisticness of our generated compounds in terms of these uh, distributional statistics, we are actually doing uh, very well compared to atom by atom approach and uh, a, sim uh, a domain specific string based approach. Um, so these are some of the um, illustrating examples of the molecules that we generated in practice. And um, um, I, be I do believe there are a lot of um, interesting questions there. Um, and we are also planning to um, uh, apply this to um, uh, antibiotic discovery. So basically, um, this is still ongoing uh, project with uh, our collaborators and um, uh, trying to generate directly new novel antibiotics. And we want to syn synthesize them and test it in, uh, in, the, in biological experiments. So just a really, um, really quick um, uh, wrap up. Uh, so molecules are, uh, are these structured objects and they provide a rich domain for developing machine learning tools. I do believe um, given the structured uh, nature of molecules, there are a lot of exciting work that can do that brings uh, the gap between like symbolic view of molecules and the neural views of the molecules, right? There are a lot of neural symbolic approaches that needs to be uh, developed for this domain. And, and these are really real problems uh, that can really, uh, we can transfer these state-of-the-art and machine learning tools to impact, to make real impacts in real life. And um, yeah, that's all of the, of the talk. I, I just put some of the links to the papers that I mentioned in the paper in case you're interested. And uh, hope I'm on time and uh, I can take a few more questions if, there's, uh, if time allows. Thank you very much. So what are the forms of domain knowledge that you can imagine having in um, this sort of generative setting? Of course, there's the, there may be some prior knowledge about motifs, but is there anything else that's there? Right, so, um, so I didn't, uh, I kind of um, uh, didn't mention about uh, how, so if you look at this from a, a you know, graph theory point of view, right? So these molecules are, you know, there, there are different types of graphs. You know, they're, um, if you look at social networks, they're like big and densely connected. But for molecules, you can see is they typically have a low tree width. So, so the, the first, um, um, so because they, they have really low tree width, um, you can think, so there's another work that I did earlier, um, which is a, a simpler version of this hierarchical model is we called junction tree VAE. So basically we reduce this graph generation approach to a tree generation approach by doing tree decomposition over molecules. So this is sort of less on based on the biological um, aspects of but more from a graph theory point of view, there are also like, um, you know, inductive biases that you can leverage. So is this uh, knowledge about low tree width uh, something that um, is uh, universally accepted or is this just your hypothesis about uh, these molecules? Oh, these are, I think, widely uh, recognized. Okay. It's just people are not bringing it very explicitly uh -huh. because yeah, this is driven by the chemical nature. You can't just have all the molecules that are um, atoms that connected together. That's that it just doesn't allow it. Yeah. Thank you. I have a quick question as well. This is Satish. Uh, this is very very cool work, and I I didn't know anything about this. I imagine you have talked to people in pharma industry, and I'm just curious 
what they think about the promise of uh, this line of work because i have friends uh, in pharma who say well you know they have to spend billions of dollars just doing all this hit and trial molecule discovery and what not so uh, i mean in principle this is just awesome but you know what do they think so yeah there are a lot of challenges as well um um so for example um well for the um the graph convolutional model that we developed we did make a real um demonstration of how this can do real discovery projects so i think the within pharma industry people are convinced that um using these property prediction models can help you discover new pro uh, molecules uh, for generated models it is more tricky because generate the model is only part of the process because once you generate a new molecule, you also need to synthesize it and then validate it. So this synthesis also uh, needs to be automated in some way. So there are a lot of groups that are trying to um, bring to basically to make this closed loop, you need a good generated model plus a good synthesis model. And uh, currently the closed loop is not done yet. I mean, this is a really ambitious moonshot um, but there are a lot of people are trying to bring a closed loop system. Um, and before that, I do believe uh, we need to sort of do this manually by um, you tweak your generate model and, uh, and then generate some compounds and then you select them to test them. And um, we are uh, on, the, on that track, uh, try to uh, validate whether this can discover a new thing in antibiotics. But at this point, it, it is a research question. Thank you.